On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we will visit the Arabian Peninsula. We will begin in poverty-stricken Yemen, where the men carry their dull daggers tucked in their waistbands. It is here that we shall discover the rock formation claimed to be the petrification of Noah's Ark. Then, we will drop by the Yemeni island of Socotra to revel in the beauty of untouched nature. We will continue our wandering in style by going to opulent Oman. Here, we will explore the intricacies of frankincense and discover the charm of camels. And to wrap it all up, we'll witness the breathtaking spectacle of nature on the shores of the Indian Ocean. Yemen stretches across an area of 500,000 square kilometers and is surrounded by some of the world's richest nations. In the time of the Roman Empire, Yemen used to be known as the Fortunate Arabia. It is universally considered an ancient and beautiful country. Its geographic position contributes to its fortune as well as its misery. Yemen lies in the crosshairs of a cultural and trading intersection. Unfortunately, it is also directly in the path of an important military zone. The Yemeni territory has been subject to the reign of countless empires and kingdoms. One of the best known rulers of Yemen was a Sabaean king who annexed this region from 750 BC to 115 AD. Not long after 115 AD, the prophet Muhammad began to spread the Islamic faith, which took root in Yemen. Let us take a trip to the distant past, to the city of Marib, once comparable to Rome in its importance to the area. The Wadi Hadramaut is an extensive valley in the midst of a parched expanse. It is one of the first areas in the world where civilization settled. Hans Helfritz first discovered it for the world in 1935. It was the traveler Helfritz that nicknamed it the Manhattan of the Desert. Judge for yourself. These mud and straw skyscrapers were erected here at the same time as wild game was still roaming, but today is Manhattan. The land of the Queen of Sheba lies wedged in between the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. There used to be an extensive dam here which facilitated the irrigation of an area of 10,000 hectares. Such a feat of irrigation was unheard of at the time. The dam split the surrounding land in two. It was for this reason that the area became known as the land of two paradises. Though it is almost impossible to imagine, on this very spot, the Garden of Eden existed around 1,000 years BC, literally right here. The topography has radically changed over the last 3,000 years. Well, something did survive the lapse of time. Look carefully at this rock formation. Doesn't it resemble a ship? The Yemeni people believe that this is the petrified Noah's Ark. It's almost as if the Ark fossilized, captain and all. The captain of the Ark was none other than Shem, Noah's son. The Yemeni believe that Shem became petrified because he refused to become a Muslim. In Yemen, one rule applies more so here than anywhere else in the world. Every man is supposed to carry a knife. We're not suggesting that there's anything wrong with that. But the fact is that most of these daggers are completely dull and meant only for ornamental purposes. The Yemeni jambias will differ in design not only depending on the status of their owners, but also based on the area where that owner lives. According to Yemeni custom, when a boy is no longer allowed to be among the harem, he carries a jambia to symbolize that he has become an adult. The intricate patterns on the daggers often attract more attention than the dagger's blade. Here in Yemen, there are seemingly a countless number of places you can go to watch the craft of dagger making. Your dagger experience would not be complete without stopping to watch by a street vendor bargaining and squabble with a buyer. The scene bears a strong resemblance to a sporting match. 
complete with a clear winner. The seller always wins. However, the real purpose of our visit to Yemen is to witness the miracles of nature. Needless to say, here, there seem to be miracles everywhere. We must leave the poor Yemenis to their prayers and their everyday lives. The Imams are calling their worshipers to prayer. And so, it is time for us to head for Socotra. This Yemen island occupies one full square kilometer and overflows with an unusual amount of nature's marvels. We are on Socotra, a somewhat remote archipelago that is considered more poor than the mainland of Yemen. But for biologists, Socotra is a veritable paradise, comparable in importance to the Galapagos. The unique and fascinating characteristic of the local fauna and flora is closely linked to its geological history. Scientists consider Socotra to be the most remote piece of dry land in the history of planet Earth. The high degree of endemism is the result of isolation. The endemism is what makes the entire archipelago a significantly remarkable location, both for its biogeography as well as in terms of evolution. 30% of the 900 plants here are endemic, and 10 species are unique. In fact, the pomegranate and the aloe plant originated here. There is so much to admire here. As recently as 1977, a never-before-seen endemic freshwater crab was discovered here, habitating within the mountain streams. Despite the existence of this unusual crab, we can't overlook the abundance of common crabs on the shores. It would be virtually impossible to ignore them anyway, given their sheer numbers and the intricacies of their sand fortresses. What could easily be overlooked, if one is not careful, is a narrow strip of nature that evokes an otherworldly impression. This is an outright botanical gem. Mother Nature manifests her might here, in the midst of endless sand. Along a tiny stream flourishes nature comparable to that found in the Swiss Alps. Everywhere you look, something utterly unique can be seen. The locals refer to these plants by a somewhat unflattering phrase. As far as we can translate, they are called the backside of an elderly fat lady with her head buried in the ground. Nevertheless, not even a hideous name diminishes the awe with which scientists view the Socotra Desert Rose. In order to survive in such harsh conditions, the plants here evolved so as to preserve water in an exemplary manner. Something resembling a small flask containing liquids forms a part of their roots, out of which the plants are able to draw energy.
Socotra is veiled in myths and legends. The mythical phoenix bird left his fiery nest once every 500 years to circle human abodes and bring to them life-giving fire on his glowing feathers. According to this legend, Socotra was the fiery nest of the phoenix. Socotra today is classified as a treasure chest of the world's natural heritage, particularly due to its prehistoric fauna and flora. A vast majority of the island's flora and fauna are endemic, meaning they do not exist anywhere else in the world. Among the best known is the dragon blood tree, Dracena cinnabari. It resembles a giant mushroom. Its treetop is made of long, thick green needles. The tree survives on dew that collects onto these needles at night. Each of the dragon blood trees are hundreds of years old. Oddly, they almost never reproduce. There are no small trees here. The dragon blood tree has a red sap, cinnabar, which the local people collect and use as an antiseptic or as a colorant. In the past, this sap represented a valuable export. Roman warriors smeared their bodies in the dragon blood tree sap so that if they became injured, they would have a clean wound that would heal faster. In those days, it was truly worth its weight in gold. Let us not disturb this mesmerizing piece of land. What nature created over thousands of years can very easily cease to exist within a single decade. Welcome to the Sultanate of Oman. A Sultanate is an unusual state system in which the Sultan rules. It seems like something out of the Thousand and One Nights fairy tale. Welcome to Oman, a country that is still considered secluded and on its own. Despite the vast oil-based wealth of Sultan al Qabus, who has aggressively sought to bring modernization to his country, Oman manages to preserve its traditions due, in part, to its lack of accessibility to the rest of the world. The greatest source of financial wealth of Oman may be oil, but the Omani landscape is blessed with a deep history and natural beauty that manifests splendor with literally every step. Magical wadis, what we would call valleys, are ever present. Wadis are created when the occasional water flows through dry regions, eroding the soil. Immediately after the rare periods of rain that occur, the water flows rapidly and creates the steep walls of the valleys. The most spectacular wadi in Oman is Wadi Shab. Its source is near the provincial town of Tiwi. The road into the pass meanders through some amazing natural beauty along irrigation canals. Owing to its oil wealth, the Sultan can afford to realize even some very extravagant ideas. For instance, here, in front of the Sultan's palace, they lay red asphalt instead of a red carpet. As you may have heard, you will never see Omanis working in Oman. All the laborers are from poorer Arab countries, usually from Yemen. And so it is that even the harvest of the fruit in the Garden of Oman is done by foreigners. Banana plantations stretching across hundreds of hectares of land are irrigated through an ingenious system of canals using drinking water. This, however, is exclusive of the natural underground wealth. Here, Muxal spurts salty seawater from hollows. The pressure is so great 
that during high tide, a sort of sea geyser is created. Long before the oil wealth began filling the Sultan's treasury, an entirely different commodity was the main source of income. On the shores of the Indian Ocean, near the Garden of Oman, lies the beginning of the Incense Road. Incense was extremely popular in medieval Europe. The Incense Road originated here on the Salala Plain. It was located on a bay which coincidentally had a port. The port was named Kor Rory and was discovered only recently. The real origin of the Incense Road, however, is right here in this crater, which appears to have originated in Oman. The slopes of the surrounding mountains are peppered with small, atypical trees with ugly leaves of interesting shapes. Among the trees are a maze of well-trodden paths made by the incense collectors. The incense trees have thick leaves to ensure survival in the desert. A question presents itself. Why doesn't such a tree find a place to live in a slightly more hospitable environment? A virtual army of biologists attempted to plant this tree almost everywhere else on the planet, but had no success. The Omani explanation goes as follows. The incense tree is a gift from Allah. The land upon which it grows may not be sold. The owner who attempts to do so would thus indicate his arrogance for Allah and his gift. The incense trade thrives here. The incense road leads from the Rub al Khali Desert, otherwise known as the empty space west, all the way to the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. From there, it continues to Europe. When the incense reaches Europe, it is referred to by its Latin name, frankincense. Clearly, incense marketing was important as far back as the Middle Ages. Let's take a short trip up this incense road. Now we are off to Muscat. The first thing to notice in Muscat is a giant incense burner. It is in the Al Riyam Park above the Mutra Quarter. Thankfully, it functions solely as a lookout point because, should it burn, it would embalm possibly the whole of Oman. We are at the souk. Naturally, a traditional incense burner is the first thing we see. We conclude our own incense road here in the local stores. Different varieties of incense are available, including sandalwood. The place is enveloped in a lovely scent, which emanates through the entire souk. Before we head off to the great Red Wahiba Desert, let's acquaint ourselves with the most loyal and necessary companion for anyone wishing to traverse the desert and survive its endless emptiness, the camel. The Bedouins claim that the camel is the Atta Allah, or God's gift. The camel is the best adapted of all animals to a life in the desert. It can go extended periods without any water, but once a camel decides to drink, it is a sight worth watching. A camel takes in some 150 liters, enough to fill a large bathtub. Also, it can digest just about anything, from cardboard to an old shoe. Arabian camels have only one hump. They are able to draw energy out of the oil and fat they have accumulated in this hump. For the Bedouins, a camel is not only a means of transportation, but an invaluable source of nutrition as well. Bedouins drink camel milk and eat camel meat. Camel wool is used in weaving rugs, sacks, and tents. Camel droppings are used as fuel, and the skin and stomach are used as vessels to carry water and milk. The camel is, in every sense, absolutely necessary for survival in the desert. Welcome to what is very likely the most beautiful desert in the world. The Great Red Wahiba Desert commences right here. It resembles a rough sea, covering a relatively small area, 12,500 square kilometers. It pales in comparison to the 9 million square kilometers of the African Sahara. Its modest dimensions are enhanced by unique ambience and breathtaking beauty. This region, measuring 180 kilometers from north to south and 80 kilometers east to west, 
was named after the Bedouin tribe, the Wahiba. Sand dunes, measuring as high as 100 meters, are continuously enlarging as a result of the prevailing monsoon winds. For all but a few, this is a remote and hostile place, only crossed by caravans of Bedouins. But appearances are often deceptive. Even in this apparent wasteland, we find life. Having originated during the Quaternary period by the continuous impact of the southwesterly monsoons and northern trade winds, this desert is the home to 16,000 species of animals and 160 types of plants. The desert turns into semi-desert, which stretches all the way to the most easterly hook of the Arabian Peninsula, the Ras al Had Cape. A stunning beach at the very tip of the Arabian world. For unknown reasons, this beach is a favorite among the sea turtles that come here from all over the Indian Ocean. These huge sea turtles beach themselves from the ocean just past midnight. They emerge onto the beach in respectable numbers in search of the perfect spot to lay their eggs. They dig themselves into the sand, lay their eggs, and quickly head back into the safe haven of the sea. Sometime later, troops of turtle hatchlings follow into the depths of the ocean. Watching these adorable babies is almost like watching human children as they pursue their very first steps. They must reach the waterline before dawn, as the heat from the rising sun would scorch and kill them. They are literally running for their lives. Sadly, many of them actually go in the wrong direction away from the water. As a result, they don't live very long lives. For those that make it into the Indian Ocean, we wish them bon voyage. May they live long, healthy lives. Good night. Sabah al khair. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we're going to the Caribbean. We'll discover an ingenious and very considerate way to visit the rainforest in Antigua. On Barbuda, we will watch a colony of magnificent frigate birds. From the Caribbean, we'll go to New South Wales, one of the Australian territories. The breathtaking Blue Mountains 
are a favorite destination in New South Wales for tourists and mountain climbers alike. Then, we'll return to the Caribbean. We'll venture to the British Virgin Islands. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us. On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we're going to the Caribbean. We'll discover an ingenious and very considerate way to visit the rainforest in Antigua. On Barbuda, we will watch a colony of magnificent frigate birds. From the Caribbean, we'll go to New South Wales one of the Australian territories. The breathtaking Blue Mountains are a favorite destination in New South Wales for tourists and mountain climbers alike. Then, to conclude today's adventures, we'll return to the Caribbean. We'll venture to the British Virgin Islands, where we will have the chance to admire beautiful white beaches and crystal clear turquoise waters. Antigua lies where the Caribbean meets the Atlantic Ocean. Anthropologists believe that this island was inhabited as early as the Stone Age. However, it was only discovered by the Europeans when Christopher Columbus made his second sail in 1493. Having endured a short-lived dispute between the French, English, and Spanish, Antigua became a part of the British Empire in 1657. In 1967, the island became autonomous as an annexed state of Great Britain. Then, in 1981, it declared independence under the names Antigua and Barbuda. Immediately what comes to mind when we say Caribbean is hot sun, white sand beaches, and of course, music. And in particular, the sizzling Caribbean beat of Calypso. Oh, skin girls, stay home on my new baby. The bays and lagoons lining the coast are ideal for fishing. Antigua gets ready for bed beneath a fairy tale sunset. The Antiguan tropical climate doesn't consist of scorching heat all year round. In the rainy season, Antigua is lashed by torrential rains. The rain ensures sufficient moisture necessary to nurture one of Antigua's main attractions, the tropical rainforest reservation and its indigenous vegetation. To protect this unique ecosystem, it is forbidden for humans to set foot inside the rainforest. Despite this strictly enforced rule, the Antiguans were pretty resourceful in devising a clever means to make this attraction accessible. In the high crowns of the ancient trees, there hangs a system of ropes and hanging bridges from which the visitors can move using their own weight and strength. Everything is done under the watchful eye of local instructors. Traversing on ropes may appear risky, but the instructors are there to ensure the safety of their tourist clients. And so tourists bored with idling on the beach and bathing in clear waters may embark on this unusual adventure. Up here, they can marvel at the beauty of Antiguan nature while not interfering with it. Um, and a lot of people come here and all they're expecting to see is the seaside and the sand and the sea. Um, so there's a, there was an opening to do something completely different. So we thought we'd do something that was uh, eco-friendly so it introduced people to other aspects of Antigua and just give another string to the bow of the 365 beaches. Antigua's elaborate coastline offers plenty of hidden bays and lagoons. During their rule, 
The English picked a bay in the south of one of the islands to create a port. It was given the simple name, the English Harbor. Today it serves yacht enthusiasts from around the world. On the eastern part of the island, there is a fascinating rock formation known as the Devil's Bridge. The surf hollowed a series of crevices and holes in the limestone, out of which geysers spur. Mother Nature manifests her might with giant waves that unceasingly devour the rocky shores. The heavy demand by neighboring islands for the pinkish sand of Barbuda has spurred the sad business of trucking this treasure to the port. The heavy demand is, of course, fueled by the boom of the tourism industry. Because Barbuda is not as easy to get to as other islands, relatively few tourists take the trouble to find their way there. To make ends meet, the local people indulge in this frighteningly short-sighted business venture. are as lovely and unspoiled as you would find on any of the neighboring islands. But in this case, they have the added feature of being secluded and thus deserted, making them ideal for those who truly want to get away from it all. Acquiring the traditional tropical treat, some coconut, requires considerable skill and agility. Barbuda does have its own miracle to share. The biggest colony of magnificent frigate birds in the Caribbean is located here, in the Coddington Lagoon. According to American ornithologists, there are 2,000 of these birds nesting here. sport a crimson lobe sack on their necks, which somehow resembles a heart. Despite inhabiting coastal areas, frigates do not swim. Their feathers do not contain the chemical that repels water. As a result, if a frigate bird comes in contact with the water, it simply cannot fly again. Incredibly, frigate birds have a highly developed sense of solidarity. Should a bird fall into the water, others will come to the rescue, trying to use their beaks to fish the fallen bird out and carry it high into the air. When they get their friend to a sufficient altitude, they drop him. The idea being that as the bird's wings dry out from the warm air, he will be able to resume flying and hunting. During the mating season, the lobe sacs of the male birds inflate to admirable proportions. Female frigates lay a single egg a year. After the eggs have hatched, they diligently look after their young. Frigate birds make their home in the mangroves, it is ideal for hatching eggs and for providing shelter from the elements. Mangroves also shelter the island from giant waves, and in particular, hurricanes. It is for this reason that the locals perceive the mangroves as beneficial and not as a nuisance weed. It would be an understatement to say that the people of Barbuda know about hurricanes. And so we must bid farewell to the islands of Antigua and Barbuda.
We now move on to New South Wales, one of the states of the Australian Federation. Is there anyone who does not know the two most familiar of all Australian animals? One, of course, is the koala bear. This one seems to be lazily dozing on a eucalyptus bough. The second, and equally as infamous, is the kangaroo. They are so dear to the Australian people, they are included as part of the Australian national emblem. They mostly inhabit an area known as the heart of the country. The only functioning NASA base in Australia awaits us in the spacious plains of New South Wales. The Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex was established in the 1960s. Scientists use the succession of telescopes found here to acquire valuable data from and communicate with satellites traveling in outer space. Currently our most distant spacecraft is Voyager 1, which has been out in space now for 30 years. Travelling at 22 and a half kilometres a second, it's now 15 and a half billion kilometres from the Earth, three and a half times further away than Pluto. The signals come back to us at the speed of light, taking 14 and a half hours to reach our planet, and the signal we reach through our big antennas here is 20 billion times weaker than the power of a watch battery. So it's literally a whisper from deep space. In the 1960s, the CDSCC satellites assisted communications between NASA and the Apollo Lunar Module. The crew of Apollo 11 brought back a 3.8 billion year old moonstone, which is now displayed here, commemorating their collaboration with NASA during that 1969 mission. Needless to say, the CDSCC is a bit of an exception in New South Wales. The majority of the land area is used for agricultural purposes. Due to its altitude, this plateau is somewhat different in climate from the nearby subtropical coastline. The landscape has an almost European feel to it. Australian agriculture has a long tradition of raising cattle and sheep. On the other hand, Sydney, the capital of New South Wales, is known for great surfing and kiting opportunities. The New South Wales coastline is adjacent to the Tasman Sea. Seabirds of all kinds thrive here. The Australian pelican is native to these waters. The question is, who happens to be the superior fisherman, the pelican or the human? Due to its mild summers, the climate in New South Wales is ideal for the cultivation of wine. Since other parts of Australia have high temperatures during the summer, grapes from other parts of the country suffer from high sugar content and are only used for making dessert wines. The wine from the Hunter Valley region of New South Wales is superb. Wine has been cultivated here since 1858 when an Englishman, Edward Tyrell, planted the very first vineyard here. It has become a time-honored tradition in the last century and a half.
As we head toward the coast, the character of the countryside gradually changes. The countryside becomes more mountainous as we near the foothills of the Blue Mountains. The Blue Mountains form a part of the Australian Great Dividing Range. The bluish haze that rises from millions of eucalyptus trees, tinting the surrounding sky and mountain ridges, also provided the logical name for these mountains. During the early days of colonization, the Blue Mountains represented an insurmountable barrier to westward progress. The first pioneers followed river valleys, but their efforts were always brought to an abrupt halt by vertical rock faces. The mountain massifs had to first be conquered in order for the plains of New South Wales to be made accessible for settlement. The deep canyons and steep cliffs lure mountain climbers from around the world. Today, climbers, intoxicated by the eucalyptus scent, conquer the rock faces with the same zeal the early pioneers had to conquer the unknown. The local technological wonder is the zigzag railway. In the middle of the 19th century, engineers racked their brains trying to find possible solutions to the challenge of building a railway in such a terrain. The result was a series of turnback ramps, a sort of auxiliary structure built into the rock. This ingenious system would have been forgotten in time had it not been for a bunch of enthusiasts. In the 1970s, they rebuilt the tracks, two tunnels, and a number of viaducts to create a picturesque steam engine train tour on this route. Such a steep ascent may be viewed as a metaphor for the development of the whole Australian society. Don't forget, Australia started out as a British penal colony before evolving into a warm and welcoming sovereign state. But now, it's time for us to return to the Caribbean. back in the paradise of the Caribbean, filled with sun, magical beaches, clear waters, and Calypso. Christopher Columbus also discovered what is now the British Virgin Islands during his second sail in 1493. This archipelago, made up of some 50 islands, lies hidden in the Caribbean Sea, about 60 miles east of Puerto Rico. This stunning place was inhabited by a South American tribe of Indians called the Arawak as early as the year 100 AD. In the 15th century, the Arawak tribe was driven out by the more aggressive Carib tribe. Subsequently, in the 16th and 17th centuries, the Dutch, French, Spanish, Danish, and British all fought for influence throughout the area. Great Britain emerged victorious, and the islands have been under its administration ever since. The islands became an independent British colony in 1960 and gained wider autonomy seven years later. Tortola is the main island, and its capital is called Road Town. 
there are a great number of other, smaller islands, many of which have private owners. When it comes to holiday venues, few places can beat a private island in the Caribbean. The multimillionaire Richard Branson has his very own island here called Necker Island. One of the neighboring islands is owned by the Amway Company. The prominent New York psychiatrist Henry Jarecki is also an island owner. Hundreds of thousands of tourists flock to the British Virgin Islands, or BVI, each year in search of the perfect holiday. As a result, the BVI are among the most thriving regions of the Caribbean. Thanks to the immense efforts of local ecologists, the surrounding nature remains pristine and unspoiled. A variety of tropical crops thrive in the rich soil. What I have in my hand here, it is a breadfruit, come from the breadfruit tree that introduced by Captain Bly from Tahiti. Now breadfruit was brought here mainly to feed the slaves in the 17th century. It is one of the local food staples. When cooked, it closely resembles potatoes or freshly baked bread. The most popular sport here, as in Antigua, is cricket a true British export. The hot climate entices visitors and locals alike to dance. Travelers are attracted to the BVI by steady winds promising ideal sailing conditions. Here, you can see yachts of all imaginable shapes, sizes, and colors. Evening sets over the British Virgin Islands. The weather isn't permanently sunny and peaceful. Hurricanes annually haunt the Caribbean. Since the wind seems to be picking up, we'll bid farewell to the islands, just to be on the safe side. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end, for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will start our adventure in Svalbard, and from there, we will head off to explore the icy wasteland of the Arctic. Later in the program, we will discover the splendor of Canadian nature in two of its French-speaking regions. 
In Quebec, 100 kilometers inland on the most southerly fjord in the northern hemisphere, we will watch the low tides set. In Alberta, we will seek to comprehend the sheer size of the Saskatchewan River and the majestic Rocky Mountains. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us.